what is going on guys this is mr stevenson here we are doing your lecture for class you should have been in class i don't know why you're watching the lecture now anyways this is the lecture i'm recording it a fifth time because it did not pick up any audio the last time i tried to shoot it anyways this is your lecture for january 28th 2021 We're going to start by looking at the artwork you were supposed to critique for homework. To critique, we need to describe, then we need to analyze, then interpret. Analyze and interpret work together for you guys because you don't have a lot of background information. And then finally, judge. So here, during a lecture today, a lot of kids just said it looks like an inflatable lobster. Or they didn't even bring up the fact that it was inflatable. They said it's a lobster doing a handstand. And that it is. But there is an upside down trash can in a dining room chair that he is doing a handstand on. And it looks like an inflatable lobster from a Dollar Tree or that kind of a store, uh, some kind of like a pool toy floaty. But it is not actually a pool toy or floaty. It is a casting of an inflatable pool toy actually made out of bronze. So we've been using cast metal like bronze since the aptly named bronze era hundreds or thousands of years ago. And it is painted photorealistically in red and yellow vinyl style paint. So even if you were in the art gallery, you'd not be able to tell that this was not a regular inflatable lobster doing a handstand on its claws. It was indeed a piece of bronze. This is made by Jeff Koons. Then we have a video talking about Jeff Koons and other contemporary artists that use conceptual art. Um, if we look at this video, we want to keep in mind the criticism of Hilton Kramer, who pretty much says these artists are full of baloney. So we have Jeff Koons. How does Jeff Koons differentiate his art from a store-bought item, if he's using store-bought items? And then we have artists like this artist here. Um, this is the artwork of Felix Gonzalez Torres, and it is store-wrapped candies that you are invited as a viewer to take any number of. This is conceptual, and the way he uses the concept of these candies is in terms of weight. So oftentimes he would have certain weights represent different things, like the weight of his lover or the weight of his father. So if his lover was 125 pounds, usually they would want this candy pile to be a 125-pound pile of candy, and then it would have to be a specific color. I want you to look at this video and think about this video in the context of what these artists claim to be thinking about when they're making the artwork. And think about the words of Hilton Kramer. Decide if the artist is telling the truth or if they're full of baloney or if they're just trying to pull one off on you. It may have escaped your notice, but recently a vacuum cleaner just like this one and the one down in your basement was sold for $100,000. Also, a sink went for $121,000 and a pair of urinals for $140,000. All of the above and even more unlikely stuff is art. That's what the artists say, the dealers, and of course, the people who lay out good money. It all may make you believe in the wisdom of P.T. Barnum that there's a sucker born every minute. The noble auction house of Sotheby's in New York last November, the long-anticipated winter sale of contemporary art. And here it is, folks. The 242, the Gerhard Richter. Please note that the measurements for this work are reversed. It's actually a horizontal painting. I'm sorry, it's actually a vertical painting. 78 by 59 inches. And we start here at $50,000 this bit for this night. And we start here at $10,000 this bit for this night. 10000 now. 1800000 Down it goes, then. At one million eight hundred thousand nine. At one million nine. I have one million nine hundred thousand. Now say two million. This one, a canvas of scrolls done with the wrong end of a paintbrush, bears the imaginative title of Untitled. It's by Cy Twombly and was sold for $2,145,000. And that's dollars, not Twombly's. And uh, $20,000 start this now, $20,000. There were bargains. Rat, repeated three times, reached 30000 Sold at 30000 yours, sir? And green grass, the words, not the plant, went for 13000 So 
and $750,000 for it. I have the auction itself was a glittering affair. A bank of phones connected Paris, Geneva, Frankfurt, and London. Among the hottest items... Lot number 72. This is sold from the catalog. Jeff Koons inspired work, three basketballs submerged in a fish tank. Sold at $150,000, giving new meaning to slam dunk. Wow, Dr. J. And back in his New York studio, Jeff Koons has more where that came from and a slightly shaky version of what it all means. This is an ultimate state of being. I, I want, wanted to uh, play with people's desires, that they desired disequilibrium. They desired pre-birth. What did he say? Of, um, the language is art speak, the same pitch that convinced the emperor to buy new clothes or waterlogged basketballs. I was giving a definition of uh, life and death. This is the eternal. This is what life is like uh, also after death, aspects of the eternal. Jeff Koons is a genuine phenomenon. Still in his 30s, he's become a millionaire since he moved from commodity brokering on Wall Street to art mongering to the world. He doesn't actually paint or sculpt. He commissions craftsmen to do that. Or he goes shopping for basketballs and vacuum cleaners. What makes them art, Jeff? I always like the anthropomorphic quality. Uh, they're like lungs. So this object now is just free to eternally just to display its newness, its integrity of birth. So what do you say to the man <clears throat> who said, fool, you haven't paid $100,000. I just got a genuine Coons for 80 bucks. This work would be a, a signed uh, work by myself or would have a letter of authenticity. He's already had a retrospective at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. You think he's making fun of everyone? You think he's making fun of the art world? No. No, he's making his money off the art world. I'm, I'm not Bumble, saying Bumble, to, uh, to bring these closer. I'm saying we need here, and we still don't uh, have this we need here. It, uh, we need out. For his piece de resistance last year, he hired platoons of German workmen to erect a 40-foot puppy made of flowers. And the art world cheered. It's very much about something extremely banal made into uh, something terrifically heroic and important. And uh, so it kind of bespeaks of our own sense of ego at certain moments in our life. Of course, most of this art of the 90s would be worthless junk without the hype of the dealers and, even more important, the approval of the critics. They write in language that, to this viewer anyway, sounds important but might as well be in Sanskrit. Of the American artist Julian Schnabel, a critic wrote, His is an eschatological art appropriating the master meanings of life and the master languages of art to reassert the sense of hurt and loss that evades both. A book on Christopher Wool, the rat, rat, rat man, said of his work, They communicate not like facile appropriations, but as a home perfectionist idea of that discourse reduced to the irreducible, then starting all over again. Arts Magazine said of Robert Gober, who specializes in arms, legs, sinks, and urinals, Installations function as utopian and dystopian spaces. The tableau arrests, and its own stillness suspends social time. And if you're still stumped, let Jeffrey Deitch, critic, dealer, and fan, explain. This work in particular shows something of the uncertainty in which artists find themselves today in the human sphere. They don't quite know exactly where they stand. So simple when you think about it. As simple as one of Mr. Gober's urinals. A major New York art collector, Elaine Danheiser, has three, all in a row. They look like urinals, but they really aren't. Well, I know, because there's no plumbing attached yes. to them. But <clears throat> beyond that, does it comment on society in some way, do you think? I think it comments on things that we take for granted and that we really don't see. Uh, that is uh, Robert Ryman. And that is... It's a, a white rectangle. Right. And um, Ryman has reduced painting to its very essence. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand that, but... I confess I'm among them <laughs> on this one. <laughs> well, some of his work has a little more texture in it. 
this one is a little flatter because he really has reduced it. Uh, he's a minimal artist. And, um, I would say so. <laughs> now this intrigues me. Yes, this is a young artist by the name of Felix Gonzalez Torres. May I touch it? You can, as a matter of fact, you're allowed, they're candies, they're Italian candies, and one is allowed to, to take, take them. But one would reduce the value of the Well, candy. then you just replace them. I see. Yes. In my observation... Art critic Hilton Kramer says the people who buy this stuff are victims of a trashy hoax. Just the act of spending that money on an object makes them feel that they are collaborating in creating the art history of their time. But is it also a case of the emperor's clothes? Oh, it's largely a case of the emperor's clothes, but they don't see it that way. When I look at almost all contemporary art, I see nothing, nothing. Brian Sewell, a London critic, is appalled. No other word for it. Imagine the outrage of a man steeped in the work of the masters when he witnessed, at an auction, the sale of a can of excrement, the work and waste of the artist Piero Manzoni. I suppose you could argue that he was making, as it were, a symbolic statement that all contemporary art is feces. There was a, a painting, if that's the word, at the Sotheby's sale by a man named Wool, Chris Wool, I think, and it was the word rat repeated three times. Mm. Art? Oh, I think you were lucky to have the word. I mean, you might just have had a blank canvas. That's pretty commonplace now. It's a, a standard assumption in the art world today that a work of art is anything an artist says it is. And an artist is somebody who calls himself an artist, and there are no other tests. I don't understand it one scrap. <laughs> I don't understand it at all. Well, that's well we don't belong to this generation. <laughs> we must retire. The dealers lust after the hypable, and a few years ago, they struck pure gold when Jean-Michel Basquiat came on the scene. His work, giant, childishly wrought graffiti, sent the art world into spasm. Jean-Michel was heaven sent for hype. The story was that this poor black kid was discovered on the street by Andy Warhol. The fact was, he came from an upper-middle-class suburban family and had a keen eye for the marketplace. But the legend stuck, and his work started selling for as much as a quarter of a million dollars per graffito. Then, in 1988, when his popularity was declining, his career was saved. He died of a drug overdose. And now that there would be no more Basquiat's, the market fell in love with him all over again. He was officially declared genius last fall when the Whitney Museum in New York honored him with a retrospective. You think you could do as well? Yeah. You, you think you could do that? Yeah. I could do better than that. You could? Yeah. But that looks like what? Some eggs? Eggs? eggs. eggs. Could you draw a better egg than that? Yeah. 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 I could draw even a yellow. It was packed with people and it resounded with art speak. So it has this multiplicity of potential meanings. It doesn't mean any one of them. It may not mean a thing. But could it's not have said it better myself. At one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. You sure now? One seventy. One seventy. The hammer's down on the last lot. The end of a successful evening. Yes, so you were extremely pleased with the sale. Total sales: twenty million two hundred and sixty-four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. And until the checks come in, the treasures wait in Sotheby's storeroom. It is, in a way, a little like your basement. The bits and pieces of a lifetime. Is that ladder for climbing? Or is it for appreciating? And that faucet, we all have one of those. It's surely a neglected bit of plumbing at Sotheby's. But no, it's a genuine Jan Dibbets, bid up to $7,500. A bargain or junk soon to be consigned to the trash heap of art history? And Hilton Kramer hand, is certain. Many of these artists, uh, as I well know, live in great dread of waking up one morning and finding that it's all disappeared. That somebody blew the whistle and they're no longer going to be considered important. That all the
vacuum cleaner does is pick up dirt. All the vacuum cleaner does is pick up dirt. And um, with the day Coons's vacuum cleaner goes back to being a vacuum cleaner, then the curtain comes down. And Coons's artwork has not gone back to just being a vacuum cleaner. In fact, that ball piece they were talking about that sold for $150,000 at auction is now worth at least $15 million. It may have escaped your notice. The next piece of art that you guys had to critique last week was this picture. One of the people said it was a sculpture that looked a little too much like Michael Jackson. Too much like him because that's indeed what it is. It is a porcelain sculpture of Michael Jackson with his pet bubbles. Um, oftentimes people say a recurring theme in Jeff Koons' work is air. He famously casted a scuba tank out of bronze. Um, we saw the lobster that was cast uh, of bronze. It was an inflatable. Inflatables are full of air. A bubble is also full of air. We're not going to go deep into this. It is a pop icon of pop music, Michael Jackson, made into pop art. Pop art is art that references popular culture and tries to bring it on par with high-end art, fine art. So... Pop culture, pop art. Pop the bubble. Um, here we have Jeff Koons' Balloon Dog. It was the last of the Jeff Koons pieces that you guys had to refer to or reference last week in your critique. This is made of stainless steel. Each of them is unique. They're unique based on the color. Um, they're cast and relatively the same size or actually the same size. It's just the color of the stainless steel finish that's highly polished that varies this is on the rooftop at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can tell because you can see the towers across the park in New York City. Here we have a quick video on Jeff Koons' Balloon Dog. We are going to watch it. I like to take note of he has a bunch of people. He has what's called a factory. He has employees helping him create his artwork. So they are working on castings of balloon dogs or inflatable toys or they are doing painting or are they doing finishes on his artwork i like to look at this and wonder is jeff coons telling the truth is jeff coons lying to us or is jeff coons lying to us while also trying to make us believe it like is he trying to let us in on the joke or is he just trying to pull one over on us Many times when people speak about my works, they'll talk about how much attention is paid to the detail. The reason for that is I never want to lose the trust of the viewer. I want the viewer to be able to stay lost in the abstraction of experiencing a work for as long as possible. The Bloom Dog is part of the Celebration series. I started the series in 1994. I wanted to make a body of work that was really about archetype, to connect people to the monumental and the everyday. When I made Balloon Dog, I wanted to make a piece that reflected the joy of celebrating a birthday or a party. I bought a packet of balloons and I uh, blew the balloons up and I just started twisting. Once I had kind of control of the medium, I chose the balloon dog that I felt was really, you know, the best suited to become more monumental and to blow it up in scale. Each balloon dog's unique. One is red, one is magenta, one is blue, one is orange, and one is yellow to show the spectrum. And also to communicate to people that every color is perfect. I've always worked with inflatables. From the time that I was a young artist just moving to New York, I worked with inflatable flowers. I worked with vacuum cleaners, inflatable basketballs and uh, equilibrium tanks. More recently, balloon Venus or swan. The reason that I enjoy things that involve air is they're a symbol of us. We're breathing machines, we're inflatables. We uh, take a deep breath. 
And we're a symbol of optimism, a symbol of future. If uh, we exhale, it's a, it's a symbol of death. It's like we deflate. The bloom dog is eternally optimistic. It's in a position to stand up to time. It's materialism and it's monumentality. But also, I want to deal with the interior life of a balloon dog. And it is a little bit like a Trojan horse. When we think about a balloon, we think of its interior as being really empty. It's a void. But the balloon dog has this interior aspect in being able to parallel life's energy it's having a dialogue with interior life and exterior life. And the Bloom Dog's a piece that enjoys to kind of celebrate the environments that it's placed in. We've had the environment of the Grand Canal in Venice be reflected in the Bloom Dog. We've had the ceilings of Versailles, the Neue National Gallery in Berlin, the Brandt Foundation the sky and the buildings of New York City from the roof of the Metropolitan. That's what has always really attracted me to these reflective surfaces. The ability to uh, continue the beholder's share. Art does not happen inside uh, objects. It happens inside the viewer. Objects are just transponders. I think the balloon dog's a fantastic transponder. It lets the viewer experience their own potential as a human being to increase their parameter. All right, so you guys can see auction estimate, 35 to $55 million. And he was talking about the balloon dog reflecting its environment. So he was referring to the installation of these balloon dogs as kind of gaining from the environment that they've been installed in. And we'll talk about the concept of installing work more because now we're going to talk about the fourth piece of art that you guys had to review, which was the work of this woman who is named Kara Walker. She is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design, where I also went to college in Providence, Rhode Island. Her work is primarily what are called silhouettes. Silhouettes just show the outline or the almost like a shadow of a story. All of her imagery is actually drawn from stories of slavery and the African-American past in the American South, for the most part. If we had to describe this, we could say that it was a silhouette, um, because that indeed gives us most of the story of it. Um, we could say it's a silhouette of a African-American girl running in the... in flames or grass. I can't quite tell what it is. It looks like it might be billowing smoke next to her. Next, we're going to look at this video of Kara Walker talking about her artwork in her own words. So here we have Kara Walker talking about her art. I'll probably need the ladder moved over a little. And, um, cool. Not quite far. Actually. I have to maybe credit my 24-year-old self for making a, a couple of good moves. When I started showing work, I was in Providence, Rhode Island as a student. I was 24 and had a big breakout piece at the Drawing Center in New York City. And it's delicate because the only two things that are holding them together are at the fingertips. This is Huck Finn in a dress and his foot is gonna land about here. People were just interested and curious galleries and calling and wanted to know more and artists they wanted to warn me against having a big success at a young age 
I kind of felt like, well, I don't know myself yet, and they don't know me either, but if I stay in Providence and take these opportunities as they come, that's good. I knew I wasn't ready to live in New York, but I knew that change is kind of inevitable and I did want to come to the city when I felt ready. I've been teaching for like 12 years or something at Columbia University. I started when I was also a veritable baby and about the same age as many of the graduate students and that was extremely awkward. When I came to the city, I felt like my newly forming ego and sense of self was just like torn to shreds. I don't think I wanted to have the role that I was hired for, which was a successful artist who was successful at a young age telling people how to get what I got. But I think I just accepted it this year that I must know something, it's been 20 years. I don't know what that something is, but if I just keep talking, then that something you know might slip out. There's no diploma in the world that you know declares you as an artist. It's not like becoming a doctor or something. Like you can declare yourself an artist and then figure out how to be an artist. It's a different art world than the one that I stepped into. It does seem to be bigger. There's more distractions in a way from the process of making one's own work. The pressure to kind of conform to a particular grad school pedigree is problematic. And I think a lot of people feel that way. It's like a reality that artists are selling work in order to pay back massive debt for these MFA programs. But I did tell my students not too long ago that they have to and will change the art world from the moment they step into it. Like if it means prioritizing, you know, critical discourse over objects or products or something like that, then if that's what you want, then you have to kind of make it happen. And if it's too expensive to make it happen right here, then you have to make it happen in the place where you can. And don't think of that as any kind of demotion. If you can look at the negatives as a student and see what needs to be changed, then you have to do that. All right, so that is the work of Kara Walker. Here we see one of her silhouettes. It looks to be a woman of African-American descent, possibly a child. Some kind of a monkey, which is probably a reference to an allegory or a fairy tale that I'm f not familiar with. It seems like she is wringing some laundry out. So here we have how Kara Walker is using installation in one way. So the way that she installs these directly on the wall, the way that they are related, uh, the distance between them, the order that they're in, varies from place to place based on where the artwork is installed. So we have the black pieces that she considers drawings that are stuck directly to the wall. So the silhouettes are directly on the wall. And then we have projections over the wall. The projections are of riverbanks, uh, trees, and things on the opposite side of the water. And these might slowly rotate or they might be stationary depending on where she has installed this artwork. She does install things in a different way that's called site-specific, and we will see where that goes in a couple slides. Here we have another image. Uh, it looks to be a few people on a boat with a slave or a man of African-American descent marching with a stick with a man hanging off of the stick and a what looks like it might be a rabbit dangling from the man on the stick's arms. So Kara Walker has explained her use of the silhouette by stating the silhouettes say a lot with very little information, but that's also what stereotype does. So she is kind of using the silhouette as in kind of like judging a book by its cover or assuming things based on race or gender, which is what a stereotype is. So when we look at these, we see the contour, which is the outside lines, but we don't see the cross contour, the actual shape of what's going on inside of this image. 
Here we have her largest piece to date. It is from 2015, and it is installed in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in the Domino Sugar Refining Factory. It is 35 feet tall and 75 feet long. It is called the Marvelous Sugar Baby. And since she is working in sugar, and she is casting sugar in what used to be a sugar factory, this is what's called a site-specific installation. And it's actually drawing her intent and her concept directly from the site that she is installing the artwork at. Kara Walker's work deals with history. Embedded in that statement, Kara Walker's dealing with history, is this kind of desire for a hero who can fix this problem of our history and racism. And I don't think that my work is actually effectively dealing with history. I think that my work is kind of subsumed by history or consumed by history. He said, you have to see this. This place is totally filled with molasses. Molasses on the walls, molasses on the rafters, globs of sugar 50 feet up in the air, just left over from this refining process. It was such a cathedral to industry and such a cathedral to this one commodity. The whole project is predicated on this space being demolished at the end of the run of the show. I had to learn more about sugar in the process of trying to understand this building. Sugar comes from sugar cane. Sugar cane is grown in tropical climates. Sugar cane is and has been harvested by slaves, underpaid workers, and children, possibly. It's a fascinating and very long history. I started putting down all of my free association ideas, starting with sugar and molasses. And molasses is a byproduct of the sugar processing. What other byproducts are there? And I got to the end and I was like, ruins, you know? It was just the ruins, everything was just in ruins. And I couldn't just produce ruins. In this book I was reading about the history of sugar, contemporaries describe something called a sugar subtlety. I love this term. A subtlety is a sugar sculpture made out of sugar paste, marzipan, fruits and nuts, that was, you know, sculpted to portray royalty and only could be consumed by royalty, nobility, clergy. The subtlety presents this opportunity to make a figure that can embrace many themes that is representative of power in and of itself. Wow. Wow. I was I was sort of grasping at too many different ideas that I wanted to bring into the piece. Like what don't you want it to look like? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I mean, I've never done anything like this before, yeah. so I don't, I don't really have like a really good opinion, you know? From ruins to the sugar subtlety, it led me to think about the, you know, what sort of figure and what sort of position would she occupy. I think there was a moment of stepping back and ding, you know, oh, what about a sphinx? You know, it was very subtle, actually. <laughs> 
it's not a kind of Egyptophile relic. This is someone from the New World. Yeah. I was not at all secure about doing sculpture. This was one of those things that was so out of my league that I, I hung back during the sculpting process. We started with uh, a clay model. The model was scanned and digitized and created into a file that could be read by carving robots. It's simply one layer uh, goes on top of the other. You always hear about sculptures liberating the figure from the block. We go back in with the bow wires and basically drag the bow wire across the blocks at angles in order to achieve the curvatures that we're looking for. No matter how incredible robotic carving is, the hand is an element that you can't get away from. And it's, and it's beyond the hand. It's not just the hand. It's, it's what's driving the hand. We're in the process of doing our first test, so we're, we're still very much in the, the discovery phase. I've done a lot of smaller tests, uh, some 12-inch figures, but nothing uh, five feet tall. So it's a mixture of corn syrup, sugar, and water, kind of like what you would use to make caramel or lollipops. So we're boiling it up to between 265 and 290 degrees Fahrenheit. We're pouring them into a rubber mold to let them set. So when we demold them, they will be covered in the sugar and water mixture similar to the Sphinx. I highly recommend a 50-pound bag of sugar for personal therapy, but if you mix it with a couple gallons of water, it's very fun. I mean, it's the most fun I've had since kindergarten, I think, making art. <laughs> I think it was very important to me to have figures made out of a substance that is so temporal, it's so um, subject to change. I really recognize what a privilege it is to be working in that space, because I can think of a thousand other artists who could take on the challenge of that space. like the interior of the Domino Sugar Factory, which is also still dripping, still producing molasses from its interior, still sort of weeping the substance. The Mammy, although she's been over in this gesture, of sort of supplication. I don't feel like she's there to be taken or satisfied or abused in any way. She's sort of withholding. I don't want to make her into a non-sexual caretaker of the city. She's powerful because she is so kind of iconic in a way and she is so monumental and so unexpected. If I've done the job well, then she gains her power by upsetting expectations one after the other. I think it's very important to look back. I don't think we do it often enough. Uh, I think sometimes looking back leads to kind of uh, depression and, and stasis, uh, which isn't good but um, looking forward without any kind of deep historical feeling of connectedness, it's no good either. All right, so the artwork of Kara Walker. 
And that was The Subtlety of Sugar. Finally, we have this piece that is a traditional Baroque painting, very typical landscape, uh, painted extremely well, uh, clouds in the sky, a tree, a man on a horse, uh, looks like horses in the background and people, there's some vegetation, some flowers and things of that nature in the foreground at the bottom of the canvas. It is a vertical canvas. The interesting thing about this is it is not what you would expect to be dry, riding the horse. It is not a white emperor like Napoleon. It is an African-American man that appears to be in his 20s wearing white Nikes, baggy jeans. He does have two swords, but he is wearing a hoodie that is decorated in kind of gold and blue and white pattern that evokes like silk robes or rugs of a bygone era. This is actually a painting by an artist named Kenneed Wiley. We're going to look at this video on Kenneed Wiley, and then that is the end of the presentation today. For a different perspective on the man on the street, you need only look at the works of a rising young painter, as our Rita Braver has been doing. If you look at all of the paintings that I love in art history, these are the paintings where great powerful men are being celebrated on the big walls of museums throughout the world. What feels really strange is not to be able to see a reflection of myself in that world. So the New York-based Kehinde Wiley set out to create a new paradigm. Men of color in street dress painted in classical style, often echoing masterworks. The images are considered so hip They've even been used as a backdrop in the Fox series Empire. Candy Wiley. Yes, indeed. And with paintings selling for as much as $400,000, the work is considered important enough that though he is only 38, a survey of his career is now on view at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth after opening at the Brooklyn Museum. His work has a broad appeal to high art culture mavens, as well as to people who don't know anything about art, but are taken by his references to hip hop and to street culture. But Eugenie Tsai, who curated the exhibit in Brooklyn, says that beyond their social statements, the paintings have undeniable artistic merit, as in Wiley's version of St. Andrew. There's so many ways you could read the face of this young man. Deliberate, do you think? I do think it's deliberate. I think one of the uh, hallmarks of great art is a little bit of ambiguity where things aren't spelled out for you. There's room for interpretation on part of the, the viewer. With his over-the-top persona, Kehinde Wiley has been compared to Andy Warhol. And like Warhol, he's a celebrity magnet. Michael Jackson commissioned this portrait VH1 ordered up a whole series featuring rap stars. But it's been a hard road to fame. He was raised in Los Angeles, where his mom ran a second-hand goods store to support the family. About how old were you when it started to click that, hey, this is what I like to do, art's what I'm all about? My mother sent me to art classes at the age of 11. I began to have kids around me say, will you make drawings for me? Will you make a painting for me? And it really clicked. He was good enough to earn a Master's of Fine Arts from Yale. And in 2002, a prestigious artist-in-residence slot at the Studio Museum in Harlem. It was in Harlem that he found this mugshot on the street. It crystallized something that I'd been thinking about for a very long time, <coughs> which is that black men have been giving very little in this world and that I as an artist have the power and the potential and the will to do something about it. So he and a team of helpers began pounding the pavements of New York, asking young black men if they'd like to be photographed and painted in classical style. But some critics have charged that Wiley is actually exploiting his subjects and that the work is cartoonish. Does that hurt? 
or do you look at it as a learning experience? You can't allow that to be what dictates your work. You simply have to say that they're talking about me. And he can be mischievous. Take a close look at Napoleon leading the army across the Alps. In small ways, I'm taking little jabs at the the, the masculinity, the, the, the bravado. It, it, even with the fact that there's sperm cells, all of this, taking this masculinity down to its most essential component. Then there are these intimate portraits in 15th century Flemish style. So I know that this particular portrait has a special meaning for you. Well, this is the first time I've done a portrait of someone that I'm romantically involved with. This is Craig Fletcher, my partner of three years. And I think this is a perfect way of having artistic inspiration and personal stories sort of come together. Wiley has traveled the world, painting young men from Brazil to Morocco to Israel. And now he's added women to his artistic repertoire. Excuse me. As shown in the PBS documentary, An Economy of Grace, he once again chose models from the New York streets. I can tell when you're getting into it. You're like, all right, yeah. But this time, he didn't paint them in their street clothes, but in designer gowns <laughs> and fantastic hairdos. The colors aren't quite right yet. He finished much of the work at a second studio he keeps in Beijing, where in a tradition dating back to the Renaissance, assistants do much of the background work. This is a rare Wiley painting where the subject turns away from us. What it does is it heightens the picture even more, so it charges the space because we want it more. And right now, the world seems to want more of Kehinde Wiley, which still amazes him. I started making work that I assumed would be far too garish far too decadent, far too black for the world to care about. I, to this day, am thankful to whatever force there is out there that allows me to get away with painting the stories of people like me. So that is the artwork of Kenneed Wiley. Also, we looked at Kara Walker. As described in the Google Classroom, we are going to start looking at more artwork by black artists. Um, we are going to do Black History Month project. We, I'm going to have you guys write a proposal for a piece of artwork. Next week, we will talk about how to make a proposal for a piece of artwork. If you did not do the critique project, there is a new version of it uploaded. Do the full critique for the three pieces that are listed in the Google Classroom. Have a good week, guys. Um, I will talk to you later. Mr. Stevenson saying bye.